Hello dear students, welcome to the channel and welcome to the lecture series in which we are discussing about the instrumentation and sensors. In earlier class we have discussed about the instrumentation and uh, today we are going to discuss about sensors and measurements. We have discussed about measurements a little in previous lectures. So if you want to check out those videos, the link will be flashing on the top right hand side corner of your screen in the i button. You can click on it and uh, you can watch those videos. Today we are going to discuss about the sensors. And uh, in general I am going to use this book. This is a book called Measurements and Instrumentation Principles. It is the third edi edition of the book. The author is Alan S. Morris and uh, uh, it got published in 2001. So now let's come to our main discussion, the sensors. So what is a sensor and what do you mean by sensing something? So we can say that sensor is something that senses the signal that is coming from the distance and by means sensing we can say identifying the characteristic of particular of particular matter or particular quantity and I it's it just uh, when I say sensing it limited it is limited to identifying only when I say sensing and measuring, so I am also measuring it. Uh, we can take an example as uh, when your brother or your sister feels feels ill and uh, asks you to check if they have fever or not. So you just touch their body and try to uh, find out if they have fever or not. So if the body w if uh, the body temperature is high, then they have fever. If it is not, if it is cold, then it is okay. But in that case, you are only checking if the temperature is cool or hot. You are not measuring it. So that is sensing. Measuring means using the thermometer and measuring the temperature of the body. That would be the measurement the exact value of that uh, temperature or whatever quantity you are measuring. So today we are going to discuss about the sensing. We are going to discuss about different type of sensors ranging from very cheap to very expensive, very rare to very uh, the those we find in abundance. All the different type of uh, ranges of the sensors we are going to discuss about. And the goal is at the end of uh, this coursework, I want you to be capable enough to pick whatever sensor suitable for uh, that situation or that particular or uh, particular circumstances. So the first step in choosing the instrument for any particular measurement situation is to specify the static and dynamic characteristics which are required. So it can be uh, accuracy, sensitivity, precision etc. But it also depends on whatever uh, instrument which you are uh, referring and what cost are you paying for it. Right? If you want high degree of uh, precision, if you want high degree of uh, sensitivity, accuracy then the cost would be high too. So the characteristics which are specified should therefore be minimum necessary to achieve the required level of performance in the system that the instrument is providing a measurement for. So once we define the stat static or dynamic characteristic, the range of instrument presented in each of the following uh, chapter which we are going to discuss can be reduced to subsets containing those instruments to satisfy the defined specification. So that was the first step. What would be the second step? So second step is 
picking an instrument to consider the working condition in which the instrument will be operating right so whatever the conditions demand uh, especially those where the instruments will be exposed to mechanical shock vibration or fumes dust fluids on on the demand of uh, demand of the situation the instrument will be working so such considerations further subdivided and subset of the possibility possible instruments are already identified and uh, and if we still have uh, a choice if we still have not converged to one particular uh, uh, one particular instrument then we uh, finalize our instrument on the criteria of the cost right we go for the least expensive one and that's what we do each and every single time when we uh, go for the purchase of any sensing device so now let's discuss about few different type of sensors so here we have the capacitive and resistive sensors both of them are electrical sensors and uh, uh, surprisingly for you if you are if you are not from electrical background if you are from civil civil background you should know that both capacitive sensor and uh, resistive sensors has two parallel metal plates in which the dielectric uh, medium gets generated between the plates it can be air it can be any other dielectric medium but it is uh, put between them so the capacitance is given by c is equals to epsilon 0 epsilon r a divided by d where epsilon 0 is my absolute permittivity epsilon r is relative permittivity of my dielectric me medium a is the area of the plates and d is the distance between two plates and uh, we often use these devices for the uh, measurement of displacement so capacitive devices are often used as displacement sensor as well in which the motion of the movable capacitor plate are relative to fixed one changes changes what changes the capacitance now often the measured displacement is part of the instruments measuring pressure sound or acceleration or any anything else but alternatively fixed plate capacitor can also be used as a sensors and uh, in those sensors the capacitance value is changed by causing measured variable to change the dielectric constant of the material between the plates in uh, in any different different kind of ways and the same principle will be used to uh, measure the moisture moisture content or humidity and the liquid liquid level as well which we will be seeing in the upcoming chapters so that was the capacitive sensor now let's talk about the resistive sensor so resistive sensor relies on variation of the resistance of uh, material when the measured variable is applied to it the principle is most commonly applied in the temperature measurement using the resistance thermometer or thermistor please note thermometer and thermistor are different sensors they are not same and in the displacement measurement we can use the strain gauge or a piezoelectric sensors as well now let's see the other the second one the magnetic sensors so magnetic sensors are uh, based on the inductance or uh, reluctance and eddy currents in order to indicate kit indicate the value of the measured quantity which is usually are in, in some form of displacement and sometimes this uh, magnetic sensors are also called inductive sensors so what do these inductive sensors do it translates the movement into a change in the mutual inductance between magnetically coupled parts so see this image here you can see 
it is a inductive displacement sensor uh, there is a single winding you can see here on the central limb let me highlight uh, let me annotate it for you so here you can see the uh, winding on the central limb of uh, this e-shaped ferromagnetic uh, uh, rod or ferromagnetic body and it is excited with the alternating voltage as you can see here alternating voltage or AC voltage the displacement to be measured is applied to the ferromagnetic plate here and it alters the flux path and hence it causes the change in the current flowing in the winding and based on the ohms law we can say the current flowing in the winding will be v equal to ir so i will be v omega by omega l okay because we are not uh, having the resistor uh, resistance here we are having inductance so i equal to v divided by omega l so for fixed values of omega and v the equation will become i equal to 1 by kl where k will be the constant and the relationship between l and the displacement d will be applied to the plate which is non-linear one and because of that the output it will be current divided by displacement characteristics so we whenever we have to calibrate how do we calibrate we take the ratio of the current to the displacement and uh, we use the same principle in the transformers we need to mention that uh, in order to measure the tra uh, translational and rotational displacement as well then we have the VR sensors so uh, and by VR I don't mean virtual reality we mean variable reluctance sensors which is a coil wound on a permanent magnet magnet you can see here uh, or you can even use the ion core as well in uh, VI sensors so such devices are commonly used for the measurement of uh, uh, rotational velocities right here you can see the uh, gear wheel it is not it is a ferromagnetic gear wheel which is placed next to the sensor and at the tip of uh, each tooth of the gear wheel moves towards like like this in this direction so uh, whenever it moves towards and away from the uh, pickup unit the changing magnetic flux in the pickup coil will cause the voltage to be induced in the coil whose magnitude is proportional to the rate of the change of the flux and because of that the output will be the sequence of the positive and negative pulses whose frequency will be proportional to the rotational velocity of the gear wheel right rotational velocity of this one then we have the eddy current sensors which consist of probe containing a coil as you can see here this is an eddy current sensor we have the probe which has a coil you can see here and what do they say after that so this is excited at a high frequency which is typically 1 megahertz and used to measure the displacement of the probe relative to a moving metal target so because of high frequency of excitation eddy currents are indeed only in the surface of the target right so they are only in the surface of that target and the current magnitude reduced to almost zero a short distance inside the target which allows the sensor to work with very thin targets like steel dif uh, di diaphragm or of a pressure sensor and the eddy current altered the inductance of the probe coil and it will change the trans uh, translated into DC voltage output right so you can uh, translate this change to DC voltage output which uh, of course will be proportional to the distance between the probe and the target uh, measurement resolution uh, often changes with the uh, with different type of eddy current sensors but uh, it can be as high as 0.1 micrometer 
and this sensor can also work in a non-conductive target if a piece of the aluminum tape is passed into it and it's pretty much basic I don't even have to mention that in detail then everybody's favorite Hall effect sensor uh, those who have worked with uh, solar may knew it may know about uh, this sensor or even those who have worked with uh, BLDC motors would uh, possess some knowledge about it so uh, Hall effect sensor is a separate mechanism or a device in itself which used to measure the magnitude of the magnetic field it has a conductor which carries the current that is aligned uh, orthogonally with the magnetic field as you can see here um, this is the current direction and this will be the direction of the field sorry this will be the direction of the field right so it produces a transverse voltage uh, transverse voltage difference across the device that is directly proportional to the magnetic field strength and uh, we know what is the how does the voltage gets generated we will v is equals to kib right where k is the hall constant i is the magnetic field and b is the field strength magnetic field strength i is the excitation current sorry so the conductor in the hall effect sensor is usually made of semiconductor material as opposed to a metal because a large voltage output is produced for magnetic field of a given size so in one common use of the device as a proximity sensor so the magnetic field will be provided to a permanent magnet that would be uh, that would built into the device and magnitude of this field will change when the device becomes close uh, device become uh, close to any ferrous material object or ferrous metal object or uh, whenever it comes into the boundary of the ferrous metal object right so uh, if you have laptop or computer in, his in your house and if you are using keyboard so keyboard push buttons have uh, this Hall effect sensors uh, in the keyboard push buttons the magnet is attached under the button and when the button is de uh, depressed the magnet moves and it uh, moves past the Hall effect sensor and induces voltage that would be converted by a trigger circuit in the digital output and uh, it can uh, this is uh, the low frequency operation but it can operate in high frequency as well right without uh, the contact bounds then we have the piezoelectric uh, transducers in which we produce the voltage by applying uh, so much uh, pressure so it produces output when the force is applied to them or uh, you can also say pressure is applied to, it, uh, to them and uh, they are frequently used as ultrasonic receivers and can also be uh, also be used as a displacement transducers so practically as a part of the device measuring acceleration or force or pressure we can use them now in ultrasonic receivers the sinusoidal uh, amplitude variation in the ultrasound wave is received right so ultrasound wave received uh, received are uh, translated into the sinusoidal changes in the amplitude of the force applied to the piezoelectric transducer and uh, in very similar way that uh, translational movement in the displacement transducer is caused by the mechanical means to apply a force to the piezoelectric transducer and uh, uh, from what this piezoelectric transducer is made of so it is made of pillar uh, made from the piezoelectric materials uh, generally if you want to know the quartz crystal are uh, considered as uh, piezoelectric materials in uh, on what on them whenever you apply too much pressure and when you use tank circuit you can produce the voltages so these have as an uh, asymmetrical lattice of uh, molecules that distorts when the magnetic force or the pressure is applied to it and this distortion causes the reorientation of electrical charges within the material 
which results in the relative displacement of the positive and negative charges. Now this displacement of the positive and negative charge will induce surface charges on the material of opposite polarity between two sides. Right, so you will have all the uh, positive uh, charges on the right hand side and neg uh, negative charges on the left hand side or the vice versa. So the, by implanting the electrodes in the surface of the material, the surface charges can be measured as an output voltage. And for a rectangular block of material, the induced voltage can be given by V equal to KFD divided by A. <coughs> Again, F is the applied force, A is the area of the material in ma uh, millimeter, D is the thickness of the material and again K is the pil piezoelectric constant. Now the polarity of the induced voltage will be dependent on whether the material is compressed or stretched. Right? If it is compressed, then uh, it would be positive. If it is stretched, it can be negative. Now the input impedance of the instrument used to measure the uh, induced voltage, it must be chosen very carefully. So the connection of the measuring instrument provides a path for induced charge to leak away. Because of that, the input impedance of the instrument must be very high, particularly when uh, where static or uh, slowly varying displacements are being measured. So the materials exhibiting piezoelectric behavior includes nat natural ones like quartz crystal or synthetic ones like lithium sulfate or uh, ferroelectric ceramics like uh, barium titanate. So the piezoelectric constants varies widely between different materials and typical value of the K is uh, 2.3 for quartz, 140 for barium uh, titanate and uh, by applying the uh, 1 gram of force on uh, barium titanate we can uh, obtain 1.4 millivolt voltage and applying the same on uh, quartz we can obtain 23 microvolt voltage. Then we have different polyceramic uh, films like uh, polyvinyl, uh, polyvinyl, uh, vinylidine. All it also ex exhibits the uh, piezoelectric uh, properties, and uh, they have higher voltage output than most crystals, and uh, more useful in uh, many of the appli applications when displacement is needed to be trans uh, translated into voltage. But uh, their mechanical strength is something uh, that needs work because uh, they cannot bear so much pressure and because of that they are not very much uh, suitable for all the applications. And uh, there, uh, they, resonate, uh, uh, they do not resonate with uh, general material. And uh, uh, just as I've said earlier, piezoelectric principle is actually invertible. So uh, distortion in the piezoelectric material can be caused by applying voltage to it as well. And uh, this is something that we use in the ultrasonic transmitters when the application of the sinusoidal voltage at a frequency in uh, ultrasound range, which causes the sinusoidal uh, variation in the, in the thickness of the material. and and the result we get the sound wave being uh, emitted at the chosen frequency. Then we have the pressure once the strain gauge which uh, uh, probably the last sensor which we will be discussing I don't want to discuss the optical sensors in very much detail because uh, uh, it would be too much and uh, piezo resistive sensor as well we are not going to discuss that in detail very much so strain gauge are the devices that experience a change in the resistance when they try to uh, they try to stretch or strain and they are very much accurate because they can detect very small displacement or very small changes right uh, it can be uh, as low as 50 micrometers so uh, they are used as pressure sensors or transducers that converts pressure and uh, changes it into displacement of uh, diaphragm. 
and uh, measurement inaccuracies are also very low like uh, plus or minus 0.15 percent of the full scale of my diaphragm so uh, you can achieve this less uh, uh, inaccuracies in measurement with the use of the strain gauge and uh, they are also manufactured in various uh, nominal values of resistance like 120 ohms 350 ohms 1000 ohms these three are very common uh, you can also find uh, the one with uh, low uh, low resistance like uh, 5 ohm so the traditional type of the strain gauge consists of length of a metal resistance wire formed in a zigzag pattern and mounted onto a flexible backing sheet as you can see here this is the conventional one and uh, wire is normally of the circular cross section and uh, a strain gauge strain is applied to the gauge <coughs> the shape of the cross section of the resistance uh, resistance wire will be distort uh, will start distorting and the cross section area will start changing now if the resistance of the wire per unit length is uh, uh, will be the inversely it will be inversely proportional to the cross section area so there is a consequential change in resistance taking place here the input output relationship of strain gauge is expressed by the gauge factor which can be defined as the uh, change in resistor for given value of strain so gauge factor is basically del r by del s and uh, recently the wire type gauge have uh, been replaced by metal foil as you can see here we are having uh, we are using metal foils now or even the semiconductor uh, uh, devices are also being used here metal foil types are very similar to the metal wire types except the active element consists of piece of metal foil cut into a zigzag pattern and uh, cutting foil into the uh, into the required shape is much easier than forming a piece of the resistance wire into the required shape and uh, it makes the device cheaper for manufacturer now uh, string gauges are made of copper nickel uh, manganese alloys which is uh, known by the trade name of the advanced and uh, semiconductor types have a piezo resistive element which are consi uh, considered in greater detail in uh, upcoming sections which we are going to discuss and uh, when we compare it with metal gauge semiconductor types have such superior gauge factor up to uh, around 100 times better but also they are very expensive and strain gauges are uh, bounded uh, to the object whose displacement is to be measured and the process of uh, bonding uh, presents a certain amount of difficulty particularly for semiconductor types so the resistance of the gauge is uh, usually measured by a DC bridge circuit and the displacement is uh, inferred from the bridge output measure the maximum current that can be allowed to flow in the strain gauge is the region of uh, 5 to 50 milliampere depending on the type and thus the maximum voltage that can be applied uh, will be limited and uh, consequently as the resistance uh, change in a strain gauge will be typically small the bridge output voltage is also small and the amplification has to be carried out and it adds the cost of the uh, strain gauge uses usage as well now the piezoelectric sensor that's a piezo resistive sensor let's talk about it uh, in quick two minutes it's made of semiconductor material in which p type resistor has been diffused into n type base and the resistance of the, uh, this varies greatly when the sensor is compressed or stretched so it's frequently used as a strain gauge or strain gauge where the uh, where the piezo resistive sensor produces significantly higher gauge factor that gives given by metal wire 
or foil gauges. Also, measurement uncertainty can be reduced to plus or minus 0.1 percent. So it's used in the semiconductor diaphragm pressure sensor and in the semiconductor uh, accelerometers as well. It should also be mentioned that the term pieces a resistive sensor in some times used to describe all type of strain gauges to all together including all the metal type strain gauges. So even though it's not correct since only about 10% of the output from metal strain gauges generated by the piezo resistive effect with the uh, reminder arising out of the dimensional cross sectional change in the wire or foil. Now proper piezoelectric strain ga uh, gauges which are alternatively known as the semiconductor strain gauges uh, it produces around 90% of their output through piezo resistive effects and only a small portion of uh, the output due to dimensional changes in the sensors. Then we have the, the two different type of optical sensors in the air path and the fiber optic path. So I'm uh, appealing you to read it uh, uh, through the book and uh, we will be keep today's class till here. If you have any doubts or queries feel free to mention them in the comment section below. If you have any suggestion or any feedback related to channel everything is welcome you can mention them in the comment section below as well i will be seeing you next time thank you very much for listening goodbye for now